Yes. So, Dharmaraj and Armini, do you want to start? We still have yes. three minutes. Oh, we yes. have three We're waiting for the right time. Okay. At nine o'clock sharp, we will. <laughs> okay. okay. Yeah. But how are things going there? Very well. Very, very well. We, uh, you know, we're, Ananda Village is like a little bubble. And so we're, we're quite protected here. And we've been, uh, it, you know, because it's a very, very small environment, we're able to control it. And uh, so we're very fortunate. And uh, but many changes, you know, we have no guests coming to our retreat facilities. We only have Sunday service live streaming. We don't meet at all in groups. Um, we had usually for the past, well, I don't know, seven or eight years, we have a beautiful garden display in April with thousands of tulips, tens of thousands of tulips. This year we didn't plant any tulips and uh, because no, no guests could come. So it's, you know, many changes on that level, but uh, none of them are, are terrible to deal with. No, it's minor inconveniences only for us. And as Davy said, we're in a bubble. And within that bubble, everyone has been able to stay very healthy. Uh, but we know that that's not true for our worldwide family. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we, we're praying for many, many of you, for all of you, but especially those when we learned someone's had a positive diagnosis with COVID. So anyway, we will get through this. We will get through this. And there's a divine reason for everything. Someone recommended to us a, a documentary nature documentary called The Year Earth Changed. And it's about all the positive natural changes that have happened in this year of lockdown. Just astounding, mm. the level of air pollution, how much it's improved and wildlife coming back and uh, whales be, uh, under the ocean being able to communicate because there isn't all the noise from the ships and the cruise ships and being able to feed their young better. And it's it just wildlife is thriving. Wow. So it's, it made me think, well, maybe there's a reason that Divine Mother is making people stay home, not drive, not travel, so that the natural world, animals and birds can have a, uh, a comeback. And then they were saying what we've learned from it when we come out of COVID then we will uh, have to make some changes if we want the natural world to survive. So there was a, but do we have time? Yeah, I think oh, it's we have time. to go. Okay. Well, thank you for that. That's, that's quite an inspiration in that too, to see the balancing side of it. So, yeah. well, um, yeah. Just so everyone knows, we are being joined by people on Facebook now, hopefully but we don't have a way to um, uh, see their faces, but we just want to welcome you all who are joining us on Facebook, the rest of Ananda India. We're so very blessed this morning to have with us Jyotishji and Devi Ji, who I'm sure as you all know, are the leaders of Ananda worldwide. And um, to have them virtually in our temple and in our home and also to have all of everyone else as well. We're so glad to have this blessing in our lives. And Jyotishi and Deviji, uh, we'll turn it over to you. Okay, well, let's start with a prayer and then just a very, very brief meditation. We'll just lead the prayer and follow along mentally. It's hard with a lag. Heavenly Father, Divine Mother, Friend, beloved God, great masters, Jesus Christ, Babaji Krishna, Lahiri Mahashaya, Swami Sri Yukteswar, beloved Guru, Paramahansa Yoganandaji, saints of all religions, beloved Swamiji, we humbly bow to you all. Bless us with thy guidance. 
with thy love. And during these difficult periods, with thy support and thy strength, help us be strong so that we may be pillars of strength to other people. We offer ourselves to thee. Use us as thy channels. Om. Peace. Amen. Now, let's just meditate just a minute or so. Sorry, if you could just unmute your microphone. Jyotish and Devi. Yeah, Jyotish and Devi. Oh. Okay. So mainly this is uh, uh, one of a series of once a month we Oh, it's so nice to see so many of you. Uh, we do what we are calling converse in conversation. And we move from different ones of our centers uh, from one to another. And uh, tonight it's uh, originating in Chennai. And it's meant to be more conversational and not so much of a lecture form. And so I think what we'll do is Davy and I will make a few opening comments and then um, we'll just have a conversation with Dharmarajan and Dharmini. And if you have questions that you would like us to answer, just type them into the chat box. But of two or three or four months ago, I don't remember exactly when, the idea came up for the subject tonight to be uh, around Swami Kriyananda, how he worked with people, his kindness, his modeling of the spiritual life for us. And um, it's always an appropriate uh, subject. But we thought maybe tonight we would also add into the general topic, how Swami faced difficult times and what he would do in a very difficult time, like what we're finding at this point, and especially uh, finding in India with this huge upsurge of the virus and all of the illnesses. Um, every day we get notification that one or another of our friends or their family have taken ill or perhaps uh, passed on. Uh, to, due to this, it's a 
really a difficult, almost unprecedented time. So coming back to the theme, what would Swamiji, how would he respond to a time like this? Well, the first thing is that he would not try to avoid it. In fact, odd though it may seem, I think he was always expecting that there would be some sort of world crisis. He warned us about it many, many times, helped us prepare for it uh, mentally and spiritually, and in some cases in practical ways. Um, you know, we have some food storage and um, make sure that we have uh, practical ways to pass through difficult times as much as we can. Um, but more, he talked to us and prepared us spiritually because our strongest help, the greatest help of all comes from God and from our attunement with God. And so, as I say, Swami not only prepared us, but I think, odd though it is to say, he was a little bit disappointed that probably what we're seeing now did not happen while he was alive because he was very much wanting to have the opportunity to be a pillar of strength and of right attitude and of help to a world as it goes through a crisis. All of us, and especially those of us who have um, deeply attuned ourselves to this path of Kriya Yoga and to attunement with master, all of us to a certain extent have if not physical protection around us, we have the protection of the teachings, the, the ability for us to go through a very difficult karmic testing time, which we find ourselves in now uh, with relative equanimity uh, and acceptance is much greater than most people have. And whatever, there, there's just partly the law of karma is that if you have wealth, you need to share that with other people. And in this case, all of us have spiritual wealth. Uh, whether we have monetary wealth or not is really quite secondary. You can be um, a, a extremely poor person or an extremely rich person and the virus treats you equally, just, just the same way. And so wealth is not a protection. Um, nothing outside of ourselves is a protection during this time. But what is a protection is our alignment of our will with the will of God. And as long as we stay in that flow, then there is a protection that comes. And there is specifically also a protection that comes from, uh, from the guru, from master and, and from Swamiji. Many of you may know of this story, but others may not. There was a time in master's life, his first disciple in the United States was a man called Dr. Lewis. He was a dentist from Boston. And Boston is on the ocean or in a harbor. And uh, Dr. Lewis used to enjoy, it, did enjoy going out sailing. And one time he was out sailing and all of a sudden a very strong squall, a very powerful, uh, quick um, storm came up. And his small sailboat was a little bit in danger of capsizing. And so at that moment, knowing the teachings and being a disciple of master, he called out to master. M master in the meantime was in California and he was reading a, a book and then he suddenly got to his feet. Uh, there were others in the room and he said, 
doctor is in trouble, serious trouble, I tell you, serious trouble. And he just uh, prayed at that moment. And then uh, an hour or two later, uh, the, Dr. Lewis was able to survive that storm, get safely to harbor. And uh, when he came in, he came in the door soaking wet. And as soon as he came in the door, the telephone rang. And it was Master on the other end of the phone uh, saying, well, you came close to getting wet there, didn't you, doctor? And so the Master knows about all of us. Uh, as he said, um, if you think me near, I will be near. And so he knows about all of us. And as long as we keep that connection strong, then he will be there to send whatever is right for us in, these, uh, in this karmic circumstance. And he will also send us strength and clarity and calmness so that we can in turn share those qualities with those who don't have them. And so we are, we're spiritually rich and being spiritually rich it is a great, great help, especially when times of deep difficulties happen like this. And to touch also a bit on how Swami helped us through difficult times. Um, and we went through many difficult times with him. You know, the our first temple burnt down uh, and then the community as a whole burnt down. And then we were, uh, had very uh, threatening lawsuits, both in America and in our work in Italy. Because whenever light is trying to emerge, darkness tries to put it down. And Swami led us through all of those things. And I remember uh, someone recent, the forest fire that burnt down the community, just virtually everything was destroyed. Um, no one was hurt but uh, everything we built for eight years was gone and uh, with no insurance and you know, no way to, no, really no savings, it's kind of a miracle we were able to keep going. But uh, someone recently sent us a little audio tape, a cassette of a meeting Swamiji had uh, right after, it's a few days after the fire. And he was with everyone in the community and he was so calm and he just was like, now what are we going to do? What are, what are the, pro the immediate problems facing us? So practical. Well, we're gonna need housing. How could, what can we do that would be inexpensive and then could go up quickly? And uh, we looked at people were gonna go out and they were gonna make teepees and, uh, and people were gonna go to different areas and get jobs to bring money in. But we just, without, getting all emotional or threatened or reactive, just what can we do to deal with the problems at hand very calmly and then giving it to God. And we saw him do this again and again whenever things got really difficult. And it, it just, it made you realize that, yeah, we can, we can face anything if we just stay centered in ourselves. And I'll, <clears throat> I'll just close with one other story. Uh, once we were in the city of San Francisco with Swami, and uh, he he was he had been doing uh, he'd been there for a few months doing a lot of lectures and establishing an ashram there, and then he was going to leave in a few days to go back to Ananda Village, and he wanted to have kind of a celebratory evening, so he invited a group of about twelve of us to go out to dinner. And then there was a, a movie he wanted to see. And so we went to, uh, we went to, the, all of us went to see this movie. It was in an art theater because it was an old movie Classic, from the yeah. 1940s. And he, uh, then we were leaving the movie. We enjoyed the movie, but we didn't put, we didn't think clearly, or maybe Swami did, but we didn't. It's Saturday night. We're in a very bad part of San Francisco, crime and drugs and everything. And we, uh, it's Saturday night, 
late, it was late because we'd seen a late movie and we have to walk, I don't know, six or eight blocks back to the cars. And I was scared. I was really scared because I we came out of the theater and you could see there were people selling drugs and you know thieves and everything. And I thought, how are we gonna make it back to the car? And Swami just led the way and he was like the prow of a ship. It was really, I'll never forget it my whole life. And it was like, he broke through the darkness and he created, we were the, the hull of the ship behind him. And we could just feel we were totally surrounded by light and we made it back to the car. And then we stayed on in San Francisco to, <clears throat> to develop the center, he left. And, but from that day on, I felt totally at home in San Francisco, no matter where I went. And, it, but it, it, the applicable thing for us in the situation we're in, there's a lot of fear. There's a lot of threatening things, unknown, uncertainty, scary. But if you can just have God, Guru, Master, Swami, Christ, whatever your inspiration is, at the prow of your ship, and you just move through whatever, whatever lies before you, you'll find that you will be protected. And you will see that the darkness of the world can't touch you. That's what Swami taught us, if you stay rooted in God. So that's maybe enough of our sharing. So I, now- I wanna share one more thought. Um, after the fire, there were kind of, broadly speaking, there were two groups of us. One was that a group of those who were very committed to this way of life and to making Ananda work. But up until that time, this was the first five or six years in the community, we had accumulated some people living here simply because it seemed like a nice place to live, uh, nice people around, not too much expected of them and so on. And so they weren't nearly as committed to this way of life as others were. And one would think that Swami would have been hard on those who were the least committed and easy on those who were the most committed, but it was exactly the opposite. Those, there were one man in particular, I remember, he was a kind of an intellectual. He had been a professor and he had a house and he had hundreds of books in the little house that he had and they were his treasure. And that house burnt down and his books burnt down and he was just kind of at a loss. The little bit of money that we had, Swami gave it to this man in order to help him establish a new life. So where a person was struggling, he was very soft very loving, not at all demanding. But for those of us who were committed and who were like the people that he counted on for strength, he didn't pamper us. I mean, Davy and I had an 11 day old baby at the time the fire came and burned down our house. And it was a very difficult time. Uh, and we were a little shook, I think Davy especially being a new mom. And when Swami first saw her, he said, how are you, Davy? Well, that's good. And he walked away. And he walked away. <laughs> he didn't allow her any chance to complain, any chance to say, oh, Swami, I'm feeling so bad. It was as if he was telling her, you're part of the troops and you buck up and face this. But as I say, for those who he knew didn't have that strength or have that commitment, then he treated those differently. And he was just like a, a loving, I don't know, grandfather or, or uncle who was, you know, didn't expect very much and uh, was just kind and supportive, but, but uh, he, he didn't, didn't really demand much of them. But uh, I think the same goes, I think he would treat all of us in that same way now. Those of us who are strong and committed, 
he would not pamper us. And those who are are not so strong and were being shaken by what is going on now, he would be soft as a gentle summer breeze and and just as loving as as the kindest uh, grandmother that you could think of. And so um, it, that's a good model for us. So Dharmaraj and Darmini, shall we start talking? We were thinking along these same lines of um, uh, Swamiji's kindness in a situation where you might not expect it, either because of a, a outward pressure affecting everybody and, you know, look, there's just no time for your feelings, not in the way that you are explaining, which is, of course, you know, very powerful, but the way in human nature people can just be... Um, you know, overcome by the pressures and kindness goes out the window. And Swamiji had even said at one point, I want my legacy to be kindness. And so we were wondering if you um, had other stories in mind, if you can summon them or share them of when uh, maybe you observed where Swamiji was kind and more than you might even have expected or he might have dealt with an attack perhaps or an unexpected situation just as you said uh, with kindness uh, any other stories along those lines well you know it in retrospect you one understands more what he was doing and working with people because he often had people around him who were very, very difficult for everybody else to get along with. And he was trying to help them. And, and you know, most very often they would misunderstand, sort of like in autobiography, Kumar and Sri Yukteswar. Uh, you know, they would think, oh, I'm special because I'm, you know, I'm, I'm close with Swami, but they didn't understand that he was treating them that way, kind of babying them in a way because they didn't have the spiritual maturity to stand on their own. There was another man, we wrote about it in the blog, in that letter, he was um, just the most quiet, shy, humble man. And he was one of Swami's first students. And he was a computer programmer and um, just, but he, he hardly ever talked to anybody. And he, he, he told me one time, he said, you know, I, I've hardly ever talked to Swami in the you know, 30 years that I've known him, but he's my best friend. And it was those people that you, so you need to distinguish between outward kindness and inward attunement. And he could be very kind to people because they needed it, but we, you know, there was that inward attunement. Um, I could name any number of people that were here from the beginning that didn't seem to have much outward contact and yet were very, very much in tune. And so, yes, kindness, but you need to understand that a man of Swami's stature was always working on for everyone's sole benefit. It wasn't just kindness, oh, he's such a nice person, something like that. He was trying to support each one of us in a, the way that was appropriate. And if that was being harsh or distant or impersonal, that's what we needed. And if it was being kind of solicitous or uh, <laughs> one time we were, um, there was a man here who Swami gave a very, a great deal of energy to. And, um, but he was not in tune. And Swami was trying to, he had good karma, but Swami was trying to bring him on the path. I mean, for years this went on. And then finally, there was some uh, gathering, some dinner, and Swami was praising this man and praising this man publicly in a way he never did for anybody else. And uh, one of the, I don't know, kind of hum, more perceptive, more perceptive person. See, yes. listening to Swami praise this person and praise this person, this more perceptive person said very innocently, gosh, I knew that man was doing poorly, but I didn't think he was doing that poorly. Meaning that the fact that Swami had to keep praising him 
was didn't mean he was doing well it meant the opposite so it you know it's paradoxical the how a saint reacts to you and kind you know what we can do is of course try to be kind to all but we can't always translate swami's behavior into human terms because he was operating on a different level and you know it was not just either or with a person any of you who've been parents know from raising children that there are some things where you have to discipline the child and there are other things where that child isn't ready yet to learn that lesson and in those cases perhaps you need to be more tolerant with them and so swamiji could like we were all like his children and he could he could see very clearly because part of his part of his consciousness was a great clarity of thought like his mind was a one of those pools of water where you can see all the way to the bottom very easily and see the stones at the bottom uh, whereas most water is murky his was his mind was very clear and he could see the tendencies in people and he would sometimes correct a person about something and and leave a completely unsaid obvious flaws that everybody else saw and uh, we we talked with him about it sometimes or sometimes he would talk to us and he would say you know i'm waiting for the right opportunity to help that person see where they're off if i try to push it too soon and they are not ready to see themselves and see that they need to change then they'll say no no i don't have that tendency no you're wrong i don't need to work on that uh, it'll drop their defense mechanisms and he said then later on uh, i have to overcome that that already predetermined mindset that i don't need to work on it so sometimes he would wait years to say anything uh, even slightly critical to people that the rest of us would say oh why doesn't he talk to that person and correct him on that obvious behavior but but uh, so it, it wasn't just i treat one person this way and another person that way it was it was very individualized and according to our needs but basically he was like a wind blowing in our sails uh pushing us toward a uh, higher awareness and greater self understanding and if our sails were not up he could only push us so fast but if we were open to him if our the sails of our heart and our consciousness were open then he would work on us and as i say he didn't necessarily pamper us he would he would blow strong sometimes and and uh, try to get us to to understand and and to change in fact more than more emphasis on change than on understanding and you know just to give you a, a better let's say his heart however was extremely extremely tender and kind yeah. and however he acted outwardly this young man i was talking about who uh swami was praising and praising finally he just said oh i'm going to leave and and you know we, so we were talking with swami and i i was in a way trying to console swami and i said swami ji maybe it's better that he goes he just could never really commit himself to the spiritual path here and swami really reacted to that he said how can you say that he swami said i cried all night when he told me he was leaving because i knew the suffering he would find in the world and you know that was shocking to me that swami would cry all night from someone leaving the path 
someone who was struggling to be on it and to begin with. And so the kindness of saints is different from the kindness, human kindness. And it's, it's rooted in our, our soul's highest good. And on our part, how do we apply that? Well, of course we need to be kind to each other and to just look wherever, particularly in these troubling times, it's very good karma to think of others' needs before yourselves. And that's maybe the biggest lesson we need to learn right now. Don't just, it's very easy to become self-enclosed and protected in your own little bubble. We're okay, my family's okay, and the other people, that's their problem. No, we can't live that way. And that's one thing, it's so beautiful to see throughout Ananda in India, all the classes and online instruction and reaching out and healing prayers and Kriya initiations and Kriya weekends and retreats and all these things that are happening to just keep everyone's spirit up. So do what you can in your world, even if you're working remotely on Zoom calls or whatever, you know, just try to project light and goodness to other people because that's what Swami did all the time. I don't think I ever even went for a, a walk with him where he wasn't trying to, like he'd be walking in a city and he would be projecting love to everyone he met. Maybe there was a little old lady kind of bent over and he would say, oh, what a beautiful shawl you have on. And he was always just giving, giving. He saw, because his heart was so tender, he saw human needs and he tried even in a very simple momentary contact to, to uplift people. And um, <laughs> one time we, we went to visit this uh, man and his wife who lived in uh, Southern California. The man was a famous writer, author. We won't say his name. And, but he was very egotistical. And he had a very nice wife, much nicer than he was, and, uh, but he totally ignored her. He didn't treat her nice at all in front of us. And so Swami saw that and it was very interesting. And they were an older couple. It wasn't like she was a beautiful young woman. She, she was an older woman. And, but Swami sat down and really began engaging her in a conversation, giving her energy, just to, I think, to show the husband look how you're neglecting this very wonderful woman. And he talked with her and, he, and they were laughing and talking. And, and this man, the author, he, he started looking and he said, what's going on over there? This, they're having a very interesting conversation. And, you know, I, and when we would see them later over the years, it, something shifted. He was much nicer to his wife in, in the exchanges that we saw. But, you know, he was always picking up energy patterns and trying to bring them in alignment. I think when we think of his kindness, we did mean what exactly what you're saying, the tenderness of his heart. Maybe we should have said the love of Swami Kriyananda because it was um, his love, wanting to love God and others um, that, you know, or kindness was his spiritual practice or, you know, he would say bliss is love in motion or love is bliss in motion. <laughs> bliss, love is bliss in motion. And so you're saying exactly what we were hoping to understand better. Um, he, he wrote that article. Do you remember um, kindness and truthfulness? No, I don't remember that. Uh, Maybe someone else wrote it and it was from a talk of his or something like that. But it, it was about including the whole reality of a situation before um, being truthful. Uh, it's something uh, I know we all strive to do, but um, it could be something you could mention also if that it's part of when he was giving feedback to others and he might wait years, but also when we're like saying the truth to someone, um, how uh, with kindness, you take into account the whole situation before you say anything. Yes. That might help people in their families. 
Yeah. Well, first of all, Swami very often approached this kind of a question obliquely. So if a person, let's say, I don't know, was having a difficulty with being judgmental toward other people and was causing problems, Swami often would know that that person was not ready to be confronted with that tendency. So what he would do is in a public talk, he would begin to talk on the subject about how when we're judgmental toward other people, it hurts their feelings, it suppresses them, how much better it is to be kind and supportive. And he would never, while he was doing that, look directly at the person that he was addressing that talk to. He would look at somebody else or look around, but often he would, almost as if addressing it to someone who did not have that problem. And that allowed the space for the person who was judgmental to form in their mind the thought, yes, people should not be judgmental. Even if the person was being judgmental in that very thinking, uh, at least they were affirming that, you, that being judgmental is wrong behavior. And so, Swami would approach that obliquely. And then when he was working with that person, he would just be kind. You know, there, there was a time when, when um, we, we had talked with him or people had talked with him about, um, you know, the, the a difficult situation and how a person was misbehaving. And he said, let, let me talk with them. And he invited them to dinner and never ever talked about that problem. He just was friendly, gave them a lot of energy and support and uh, uplifted them. And so there was kindness, but also he was very aware of what needed to shift in a person. And, but he was trying to work with them both in a rhythm and in a way where he wanted them to say yes to the shift that needed to happen rather than push it on them before they were ready and have them say no to it. And so timing was very important. So coming back to the question, how did he work with that kindness? One of the ways was by um, working with situations <clears throat> and with people in a somewhat oblique manner instead of a confrontive manner. And probably all of you have, uh, you know, situations in your family or at work where something is off. And how do you move that? Do you confront that directly? Sometimes it is necessary to do that. But very often that does not result in a positive behavioral change. And so often it's better to model the right behavior or to talk with others about the right behavior in the presence of the person with the wrong behavior, you know, those oblique things. And I'll just kind of end with a rule of thumb, which is unless a person is asking for your correction, generally speaking, it's better not to give it. And that, because, uh, they, they have not yet opened themselves to, to your guidance. Yeah, I'll share a, a personal story. Some of you, we may have shared it with some of you, but I do want to take a moment and to say how absolutely delightful it is to see all of you. And um, I know many of you stay in touch. We just have to say Prem Kumar, every single one of our blogs we you comment on and yeah. we, it's like a beautiful connection and mary uh you commented on the last one and, yeah and, you often comment yeah and, and Ishwani, many of you yeah and anyway whether you do or not we're not soliciting comments but it's more seeing your faces it, it's really a joy for us but 
to share a story about Swamiji, uh, how he tried to help people stay in, in harmony with each other through his wisdom. Once um, so, uh, someone, a couple wrote to Jyotish and me and a real scathing letter just saying, oh, you're doing everything wrong. You have the wrong attitude and you're bad leaders and you know, on and on and on. It was a long letter and filled with criticism of us. And we got it and we read it and we were kind of shaken. You know, is this true? Are we really that off? And, but that right after we read the letter, there was a, a big gathering at Swami's house, a big satsang. And so it wasn't really a satsang, it was a holiday party. And so we went down and we weren't gonna say anything to anybody about the letter, but Swami took one look at us and he said, what's wrong? I mean, we didn't say anything. And he said, come in. And we pulled us into this little private room and he closed the door and we told him about the letter. And we said, Swami, you know, is, is what the person wrote true? I mean, if, if we're really that off, please tell us. And he said, Swami said the famous lines, you're doing the best you can for who you are. <laughs> he didn't say it's right, it's wrong. He just said, you're doing the best you can for who you are. And then I wasn't wanting to be kind of uh, validated. I said, well, were they wrong in writing that letter? You know, kind of reactive. And Swami's answer was wonderful. He said, they're doing the best they can for who they are. And then he paused and he said, and I'm doing the best for who I am. And you know, if he had taken any other position, that would have created, if he would have, that would have created such a wall between us and those that are those other people that never would have been broken down. But by taking a neutral, supportive position of everyone, it could we could find a way that we could be friends after all that cooled down. And so again, working with others, family members, coworkers. Don't polarize, don't take sides, even if you know what one is wrong and one is right. But but just try to make everyone feel the, the best about themselves. And that was what creates harmony. When people feel accepted for who they are, their behavior is much more harmonious and positive. And that was a very good lesson. You know, we I wanted validation and he didn't give it. He didn't give it, but he validated our highest self, which was much more important. One of the things that he did, and I'll be brief with this, is he saw the action or the words, but he didn't focus on that. He focused at least one level or two levels beneath that. So if a person in this case was critical toward us, Swami didn't react to the words of the criticism, but rather he looked at what was it in them that made them write a letter that was critical in that way, so that he would see what is the source, what is the psychological root that from which this uh, sprout is growing. And let me look at the root system, not at the at the growth that's above ground. And, and then he would try to work on that root system. Maybe it was insecurity. Maybe it was a jealousy of position. Maybe, you know, in, in fact, in this case, I think it was both of those that the people who were critical um, were a little jealous of our position and, and a little insecure in theirs. And so they were uh, reacting in that way. So, but Swami didn't react just to the action. He looked at what was underneath. And then the advice that he gave, they're doing the best they can for who they are. He understood what the psychological or karmic kinks were that were forcing the behavior that way. And he worked in that way. But, but coming back to kindness, that that understanding of, of our deeper nature and always trying to help us lift up that deeper nature and get more attuned with God was 
a spiritual kindness that he um, that he was constant in his in in his ability to do that. And I'll I'll tell one more story. But I do, we could tell a lot of stories, but this was when Swami was in the hospital. Um, well, here's there's two stories. I, I'll start with one, and we'll see if there's time for two. Um, he was in the hospital a lot. He had a lot of health problems and he was taking on karma for Ananda, for other people. And, but in this particular occasion, uh, he had had heart surgery and we were with him in his room in the hospital and this hospital was filled with flowers. I mean, just almost no room for any more flowers to be brought in there. And he said, and uh, there were a number of maybe four or five of us in the room with him. And he said, you know, there are probably some people in the hospital who are maybe don't have many friends or family and, do, and I've got so many flowers. Could you all just take the flowers from my room and go to room to room? And if the people don't have flowers, go in their room, bring the flowers, talk with them, ask how they're doing. And it was the most fabulous experience. I mean, the nurses said, you have transformed all of us and Swami, you transformed the whole hospital. We went from room to room to room, bringing flowers, talking to the people, giving love, giving energy. And again, here's a man just coming out of heart surgery. And all he's thinking about is, oh, there are people who don't have friends to bring them flowers. So, I mean, it was such a beautiful experience. And then another time, this was, he had had, hip replacement surgery. So he was in a wheelchair. And uh, he, he said, maybe you all could take me up and down the hall in my wheelchair just to get out of the room. And so we, we were wheeling him down the hall. And at the very end of the hall, there was this old man in a wheelchair, but he was very, uh, I, you know, it was like his mind wasn't clear. And he was sort of, they had him strapped in the wheelchair so he wouldn't fall out. And so he said, oh, let's go say hi to that man. So we, we wheeled the wheelchair up to this man. And Swami just said, good morning. I mean, but with his soul energy and the man, it was like he woke up from the slumber of ages. And you could just see him kind of lifting his head opening his eyes, focusing his eyes. And there's this radiant soul in front of him, wishing him good morning. And I don't know if he'd spoken to people in a long time, but he just said, good morning. And it was just like watching a miracle. And again, just caring. I mean, who cared about that little old man in the corner of the hospital, all strapped in, you know, uh, unfairly, almost un, unaware of what was going on around him, but Swami cared and he gave him energy. And who knows, but then in the man's next life, he probably didn't have a lot of years left in that life, he would pick up on that energy and, and start a new way of life. So it was never ending with him, just a model of caring for every soul with whom he had an encounter. And, and he, gave us that model to help us. So there will be people in your life right now that need energy. And maybe they're not quite as dire as that old man strapped in a wheelchair unaware, but, but their energy is down. Maybe they're fearful, maybe they're hurt, maybe they're grieving, maybe whatever it is, these times especially, uh, there are so many people with so many needs. Be proactive in reaching out to them. That's, that's what Swami did. Um, that was part of that lesson is that don't wait for them to reach out to you. You send your flowers to, to people around you, uh, flowers of kindness, flowers of support and caring. And uh, it, it will, just as our actions transform that hospital, your actions will transform uh, the little world, uh, especially, frankly, right now, the world is a hospital. People are sick in either body or, 
or mind and emotions and sometimes in spirit. And so uh, be a doctor and be, or a nurse and, and uh, reach out proactively to, to look and see, just think for when, when we're finished, think for a little while about who it is in your world that could maybe use a phone call or maybe use a, uh, some kind gesture and, uh, and and try to use Swami's energy just the way he used us as his channels to carry those flowers. Now he's using you as his channels to carry kindness to people. We were sharing before everyone came on. Yo. No, we're, I was no, just- please, please go oh. ahead. Oh, did you have a question? It's okay. All right. We were sharing right before you came, everyone came on. We had watched someone recommended a nature documentary called The Year Earth Changed. And it's uh, very, really wonderful. It's uh, well worth watching. Very inspiring, actually, how nature is coming back and the air is getting cleaner. The oceans are getting cleaner. The whales and the penguins, everything's coming back that was endangered. Ganges has 80% more, more oxygen. oxygen in it than it did a year ago. Yeah. But there was a story, uh, it's from, in, you know, situations all over the world, but there was a beautiful story from a village in India uh, where there were, uh, it was an area where there were a lot of elephants and the elephants, because the farmers have encroached on their natural, uh, the uh, feeding grounds, the elephants feeding grounds, they would every year come into the farmers rice fields and eat half of their crop that they were dependent on and sometimes even come into the village and uh, people had said uh, 400 people were killed a year in India by elephants in the different villages. So this one during COVID lockdown, when many of the uh, worked migrant workers in the cities came back to their villages, this one village came up with a plan and they- It's a nature conservative. Yeah, a nature a conservatory trust helped fund it. And they, because there were all these extra workers who had come from the cities, they began planting all around their field that they depended on food for the elephants, grasses and wild rices and things like that. And they didn't know if it would work or not, but you know, it was very lush and then they they went back they they you know went back to the village, and um, then the elephants it showed they had it videoed. They came out of the forest, and they they understood elephants are very intelligent. They understood that this all had been planted for them, and they ate only all around the farmers' crops, the food that had been planted for them, and they didn't eat the crops the farmers defended the crops the farmers depended on. And it said many other villages are wanting to do this now. And so working in harmony with the world around us, not just, it showed before they would dry the elephants out with flames and throwing rocks. And now they said, come, we wanna provide, you're, you're coming into our fields because you're hungry. So think about your own life. If there's somebody that's intrusive, difficult, they're doing it because they're hungry on some level. And rather than push them out, feed them. Feed them with kindness, with respect, with support. And, and I mean, we can change the world this way. Swami showed us this. So. Well, thank you both for what all that you shared with us because it was in addition to all the stories, all the vibration of Swamiji's kindness has come through in what you've shared and also in, in who you are uh, for all of us and your kindness too. Um, and we all just wanted to take a moment of our own to say thank you uh, both for all the letters that you send each week and, and Davy G, your letter was very inspiring to all of us that we were all sort of uh, sharing it in our groups because it was, and it was such a wonderful thought to a letter to Swamiji um, again, very powerful, and you could almost feel his reply. Um, the uh, no, 
you had, weren't you saying something? No, I was going to say that. So. Oh, <laughs> he was going to ask you what I suggested, which is, would you like to um, end us with a healing prayer, uh, just leading a healing prayer for all of us? I'm, I don't mean for us, I mean for the world. Right, right, <laughs> right. Of course. But Darmini and Dharmaraj, thank you for hosting us. We miss, we miss you all. We miss spending time with you. You're very dear friends. And we're so happy to see you and see you doing well. Everyone looks very bright and, and a little bit hot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you can tell it's hot there. It's actually cool here now. We're, we're in a drought but they're predicting rain tonight and tomorrow. So every, every inch helps. So uh, it's a little bit cool here now. So, okay, let's thank you all and God and Guru bless you. And uh, just take what the grace of God that's been given to you and share it with others. That's what Swami taught us and what he did with his life. So shall I do a yeah. hand prayer? Okay. Feel her center in your heart and feel there a calm circle of light, sphere of light, filled with your love for God and Guru. And feel that sphere of light expanding surrounding your whole being with the divine grace of God and Guru. Focus especially at your spiritual eye and feel light there, calm, steady, And now feel that sphere of light expanding to embrace everyone you know, everyone in Chennai, expanding and expanding everyone throughout India, those who have lost a dear one, those who are struggling with COVID, those who are hospital workers and health providers who are striving to help others, those trying to, to supply oxygen and vaccinations, may all obstacles be lifted. That throughout India, a great wave of peace and harmony and cooperation and well-being move throughout the country. And spread that sphere of light beyond India, throughout all of Asia, Europe, Africa, across the oceans, to North and South America, the whole world, a tiny bubble of light floating in the consciousness, the infinite consciousness of God. And let's, as Master taught, rub our hands together and let's chant home, sending from our hearts this light of God to heal, uplift, protect, and love each soul, each being on earth. Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. 
Thank you both so very much. It's really such a blessing this morning was, and thank you all for joining us here in Chennai and uh, parts beyond. Um, we're so glad we could all be together in this moment in this way with both of you. We feel the yeah, same. We very much feel the same. God bless you all. So they've left.